Hi, and welcome to No Place Like It, a podcast on fictional homes. I'm your host, Talia Ulrich, and together we'll be exploring the ins and outs of imagined living spaces. This week, we're looking at the humble and not so humble establishments of Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence. I promise there are no spoilers ahead, although, if you have not read the novel in the 100 years since it was published, then what are you waiting for? Since Wharton herself was living just outside Paris at the time she wrote The Age of Innocence, she had her sister in law Minnie conduct research for her so she could recreate 1870s New York in the novel. The two of them exchanged letters across the pond, with Minnie telling Edith what she could or couldn't use in her novel based on the historical records of the time. The result is some incredibly detailed historical references. And more than a few mentions of interior designs specific to the Gilded Age of 1870s New York. The very first living space we're introduced to in the Age of Innocence is Newland Archer's Gothic Library, the only place he could smoke his cigars in the house he shares with his mother and sister. This library is his particular space, the Gilded Age equivalent of a man cave, as it were. Although glazed black walnut bookcases and finial topped chairs are a far cry from today's plywood TV consoles and beanbag chairs, or whatever it is that modern men are using for furnishing, the concept of the man's private space remains the same. Whether they are smoking cigars, i n d r i n k i n g port, Or watches sporting events and drink a beer. The male centric living space occupies nearly every fictional dwelling, and many non fictional ones as well. I am not entirely sure why a man would need a room of his own. It seems rather excessive for their kind. Newland's Gothic Library contains black walnut bookcases, as well as a black walnut writing table and brass inkstands. There are also finial topped armchairs placed before the fire with some brass ashtrays for the cigars. While the description seems dark and gothic, the feeling of coziness pervades with the comfort of the fire and the promise of a relaxed cigar. This feeling of comfort is evident in the scenes which take place here. In these scenes, Newland gives over to his anger, feeling free to express himself unguardedly without concern for propriety in the presence of his guest. Clearly, he feels the Gothic library is one of the few places he could be open with his inner thoughts, which include an insistence that women should be as free as men. This may be Newland's comfort place, but it is another living space entirely. Which has its main focus on relaxation. While Newland's library is in the Gothic design, his fiancee's grandma, Mrs. Manson Minge, prefers a different and older style. Actually, the fourth chapter has a whole section dedicated to discussing her interior design preferences. When she had her house built, she had, quote, bodily cast out the massive furniture of her prime and mingled with the Mingott heirlooms the frivolous upholstery of the Second Empire style, unquote. She scorns the popular styles and likes frivolous upholstery. This is already my favorite house. Point often made about Mrs. Manson Minkett, who is also known in the novel as Old Catherine, is that she is enormously fat and cannot walk up and down stairs. Therefore, she does not leave her house to visit other people. Instead, they must visit her. Here is where the Second Empire style comes in. The interior design styles made popular during Napoleon III's rule favored comfort. 
with rounded and loomy armchairs. These were tarred wooden chairs. They were plush and luxurious and typically covered in luxury fabrics. Opulent relaxation was the goal for this style, which makes it perfect for a wealthy woman like old Catherine, who never leaves her house. Not only does old Catherine scorn the popular styles of her time, she also arranges her house differently from the fashionable homes of New York. Edith Warren describes this in a delightfully worded paragraph, which I will now read. The burden of Mrs. Manson Minkett's flesh had long since made it impossible for her to go up and down stairs, and with characteristic independence she had made her reception rooms downstairs and established herself in flagrant violation of all the New York proprieties on the ground floor of her house so that as you sat in her sitting room window with her, you caught, through a door that was always open and a looped back yellow damask portiere, the unexpected vista of a bedroom with a huge low bed upholstered like a sofa and a toilet table with frivolous lace flounces and a gilt-framed mirror. Her visitors were startled and fascinated by the foreignness of this arrangement, which recalled scenes in French fiction and architectural incentives to immorality such as the simple American had never dreamed of. What a scandal! I particularly love the phrase, architectural incentives to immorality. Imagine requesting that of someone designing a home. While Catherine prefers the Second Empire style, there is another French design influence within the novel, one more popular within its time city, and that is the Art Nouveau style. An important distinction between the Second Empire style and the Art Nouveau style is in the color tones. The Second Empire style featured heavier, more saturated colors with dark and bold floral wallpaper. The Art Nouveau style was much more understated, with light pale colors and more delicate floral designs. Since we won't find much of the Art Nouveau tastes in old Catherine's home, we shall leave her house on Fifth Avenue and venture to the Bander Leiden's house on Madison Avenue. At the Vander Leiden's mansion, we enter through a set of double doors into a drawing room with high ceilings, white walls, and pale furniture. The mantelpiece is white marble and holds an ormolu clock and other such ornaments. For those wondering, ormolu is a technique wherein high carat gold is applied to bronze objects. We know this more commonly today by the term gilt bronze. It's precisely the kind of home accessory you picture when you think of the Gilded Age, which I'm sure we all do on a regular basis. If you'd like some Ormolu pieces, or you're just curious, eBay and Etsy have some great offerings available. The price ranges from doable on a budget to one full month of rent. The Van der Leiden's white, pale, and gold drawing room is not the only example of their preferred home design. Their country seat, Skydercliff, is a pale green and white house with grooved walls and fluted columns, while their Madison Avenue drawing room is accented with marble and gilt bronze. The Skydercliff house is surrounded by steel and elaborate cast iron ornaments. The Wanderleiden's taste has an understated elegance that features lighter colors to let their more ornate pieces stand out. 
It's a far cry from the Second Empire's so-called frivolous upholstery, but one that is nearer to the contemporary style of the novel's time. So far, we have ventured through the homes of New York's fashionably wealthy. Now we will turn towards a less wealthy and less fashionable side of 1870s New York, which is West 23rd Street. Alan Olenska's house on West 23rd Street. Which she rents from her aunt Medora, has a peeling stucco facade with giant wisteria crawling along its cast iron balcony. The interior is shabby, with discolored wallpaper of a pampas grass background, and the drawing room decorated in a most eclectic manner. Ellen's few belongings personalize the space: some small dark wooden tables, a delicate Greek bronze statue. And a couple of Jacqueminot roses. The roses are particularly noteworthy to Newland, because they're always bought in the dozens, so it's rare to see only two of them. Ellen prefers not to keep her flowers in their bouquets, and instead scatters them around the room. She does the same with books, rather than keeping them neatly away in a bookcase. This attitude to her belongings is indicative. Of a free-spirited aesthetic, but it's also a symptom of Ellen's desire to be free and not caged in an unhappy situation. Why would you keep your flowers and books in so-called proper places when you don't even want to be in the place society thinks you should be? Think is particularly special about Ellen's home is the way she feels about it. She says it's like heaven. She doesn't care that it's not a fashionable part of town, so long as she feels safe and can be in her own country. Her wealthy relatives hate her house, but she likes it, which is what makes it so endearing. It's a home to her, not a symbol of wealth or status. Which is in total defiance of New York society and its obsession with the fashionable. Since West Twenty Third Street is definitely not a fashionable side of 1870s New York, we must venture east towards Fifth Avenue to see a house that is definitely not a home, but a symbol of wealth: the Beaufort House. Before we enter the Beaufort House, we should first ensure we are properly coiffed and attired, as it is the night of their annual ball. Their ball is the only time we get to see inside their house, but it is a real treat. The Beauforts live in a brown stone mansion, which is older than any of the other homes we see in the novel. The first room we're entering is the library, where Spanish leather hangs on the walls. For those wondering, this wasn't a plain piece of leather, but something that had been gilded, embossed, and painted to create a textured artwork. Some pictures of Spanish leather wall coverings appear similar to anaglypto wallpaper. If you'd like to decorate your home with some textured wall art, I'd recommend anaglypto over the leather, as it is much more sustainable and somewhat less likely to result in cow deaths. The Beaufort Library is furnished with boule and malachite. Boule is furniture that has been inlaid with tortoiseshell, brass, or other colored metals. Wood furniture covered with the semi-precious stone malachite was quite popular during the 18th and 19th centuries, particularly amongst Russian nobility. As with the ormolu, you can find malachite furniture on eBay. With price ranges from a week of minimum wage labor to why go to college when you could buy this instead, 
Malachite furniture is an excellent addition to your home decor, especially if you're looking to create the vibe of a 1970s Bond villain. We move from the Beaufort Library to the Crimson Drawing Room, where Mrs. Regina Beaufort is receiving her guests. So far, we've only been in one drawing room in all the other houses, and we have received no hint that they have more than one drawing room. Edith Warren tells us up front that the Beauforts have three drawing rooms. The drawing rooms are set up next to each other, forming an enfilade, which is a feature of European architecture more commonly used in palaces, museums, and art galleries than it is in regular living spaces. These drawing rooms are known to us by their colors, the sea green, the crimson, and the bouton d'or. The house is set up, so we must pass through all three before getting to the ballroom, which sounds like the ultimate test for deciding if you really want to be there or not. There is not a lot of detail about each drawing room, other than a painting of a naked cupid in the bouton d'or. But Wharton points out the floor is polished, and we could see the candles reflected in it. The flooring is parquet, and in fact, a quick Google search into parquetry turns up Wharton's very phrase in this chapter, where she notes that guests could see, quote, many candled lustres reflected in the polished parquetry, unquote. No detail is given into the patterns of the floor, but one helpful suggestion of my Google search is that parquet flooring is most commonly found in modern-day basketball courts. As basketball would not be invented for another two decades, the Beauforts likely did not host any pickup games. However, they might have influenced architects to model the courts after their own flooring. I wanted to put it past them. After the drawing rooms, we come to the ballroom, which is used only once a year for this very ball. The rest of the year, the chairs are stacked away and the chandelier wrapped up. I want to stress here that just because the chairs are stacked in a corner, that does not mean they are stackable chairs. Stackable chairs would not be invented until the 1960s. So in the Gilded Age, men had to find other ways to try to impress women than carrying multiple chairs at once. Beyond the ballroom and the drawing rooms, there is the conservatory with tree ferns and camellias presiding over black and gold bamboo chairs. These were most likely not real bamboo, but imitation bamboo painted gold. If you have not already accrued substantial credit card debt during this episode, you could purchase some choice pieces of 19th century gilded bamboo furniture at firstdibs.com. The price ranges from the grocery bill of a single person living alone to the grocery bill of a four-person family where two of those people are in training and must bulk up. In other words, they cost a lot now. In fact, everything in the Beaufort house cost a lot then, from the Spanish leather and the Malachite furniture to their non-stackable bamboo chairs. The Beauforts clearly want to convey wealth through their mansion and its belongings. But are they truly wealthy? You'd have to read the novel to find out. For the next episode, we're staying on Fifth Avenue, where we'll head to the Waldorf penthouse to hang out with Blair. It's the original Gossip Girl TV series, and we're all living under Queen Bee's reign. The script and research references for today's episode are available at acutelittleshop.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, rate, and subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever platform you use for podcasts. 
Thank you so much for listening.